Well, now that we've completed the Tanakh, the Old Testament, from a chronological perspective, it's time that we connect the myriad of dots. Close to 15 years ago, when I first taught the Torah to you in a formal setting, in my introduction to the book of Genesis, I said that the Torah and the Old Testament should not be taken as a series of independent historical events. But rather there is a flow to the, to the scriptures that's like a beautiful river. And the events that we read about are like mile markers along the way of redemption history. No doubt because of the in-depth nature of our studies, the passing of all these years can make it challenging to get a horizon-to-horizon -horizon view of our completed journey. That's the purpose of these next few weeks. If you came into these studies midway, this is going to be all the more helpful to you. If you started it at the beginning, this is going to be like going to a family reunion. That may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your situation. <laughs> or maybe the opening of a family photo album. Since midway through the book of Genesis, the remainder of the Bible is told through the establishment and the progress of the Hebrew people, then that is the course of the river that we're going to follow through this Old Testament survey. Abraham is the best place to start because it was with him that God made an irrevocable covenant out of which the Jewish people and mankind's redemption would ultimately come. Although Jews correctly consider him their forefather, Sometimes he's even spoken of as the first Jew. I've heard him called the first Israelite. And since the name Israelite could not have happened until God changed Abraham's grandson's name from Jacob, Yaakov, to Israel, and since the term Jew began with the tribe of Judah, one of Jacob's 12 sons, it would sure be a stretch to apply either the term Jew or Israelite to Abraham, except maybe in just kind of a poetic sense. Now, although the Bible doesn't tell us, Hebrew scholars say that Abraham was probably an Amorite. Now, an Amorite were one of several semi-nomadic subcultures living within the many Sumerian cities of ancient Mesopotamia. Most archaeologists believe that Amorites were the dominant Mesopotamian culture of, of, of that day. <clears throat> it appears that Amorites were a particularly troublesome people for their neighbors, as they were among the most aggressive in pursuit of territory and of power. In fact, it is now known with some certainty that that, that famous war chief and conqueror Hammurabi, who ruled for about ruled about a hundred years after Abraham's time, was an Amorite. Now, Abraham was born sometime around 2000 BC in an area historically known as the Fertile Crescent. Now, the Fertile Crescent was called that because it lies in the flood plain between and along the Tigris and, and, and Euphrates rivers. And this is where regular flooding would deposit rich silt that was just ideal for agricultural use, hence fertile. And he lived, at least for a time, in the city-state of Ur, in a region called Mesopotamia. And today, Ur, in much of Mesopotamia, falls within Iraq's borders, next to the Euphrates River. Ur was the center of moon god worship. And much of that ancient city has been excavated, and there's no doubt as to its identity. Now, Avraham's father was Tarach or as we better know him, Terah, a descendant of Shem, who was one of Noah's three sons. And at first glance, this would seem to be incongruous with Abraham being an Amorite, because the Amorite tribe did not come from the line of Shem, but rather from Shem's brother, Ham. 
However, all evidence is that by the time of Abraham, the Amorite tribe had become so successful that the name Amorite came to represent an entire culture, not just a large extended family, which is basically what a tribe is. So only about 350 years had passed since Noah and his family had escaped that world-destroying flood by constructing an ark, an enormous ship that Noah built at God's command. And if you were alive in 2000 BC, you could have asked Noah himself about the great flood. Because he was still living when Abraham was born. Now in our modern era, about 200 years ago, a scholar invented a name for the countless descendants of Noah's son Shem. The scholar called them Shemites. We now say Semites. The term stuck. Therefore, genealogically speaking, Abraham was a Semite, a Shemite, since he descended from Shem. Now, being a Semite identifies Abraham not to a geographical region or a culture, but to a family, a certain gene pool. And unfortunately, we most often hear this term in our day used in the phrase anti Semitic, meaning some type of predisposition, uh, predisposition or bigotry against the Jewish people. Now, during Abraham's era, about 4,000 years ago, Civilization was in full swing, although it manifested itself quite differently from region to region and continent to continent. And in Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, the areas the Bible primarily concerns itself with, there were hundreds of tribes and clans that were nomadic to some degree. Where cities formed, they were generally what's called city-states. That is, they were small nations, actually with defined territory that was quite limited. And usually the territory didn't go much beyond the city walls. Typically each city-state had its own king, most often its own set of gods. And there were constant skirmishes between these city-states, some serious, some amounting to little, but usually it involved stealing each other's possessions and livestock and idols and food and pasture land and sometimes taking people for slaves and, and servants. <clears throat> and the taking of people from another tribe or a nation was a common way for kings and tribal leaders of this time to, to more rapidly grow their own population, thereby increasing their personal security, wealth, power, and status. Now some cultures were tent dwellers, which meant they were wanderers, constantly moving from area to area, seeking fresh pasture land and water for their flocks and their herds. Others, the semi-nomadic, tended to stay in an area longer than their nomadic tent-dwelling neighbors, so they lived in non-portable huts constructed of the local flora and fauna. And then again, there were the so-called sedentary peoples, meaning that they lived permanently in cities with governments and taxes and mud brick and stone houses, magnificent palaces in some cases, temples, roads, even sanitation systems. Most often, these several types of cultures lived side by side and were symbiotic. Now, in Abraham's time, only about 200 years had passed since the Tower of Babel episode, when God scrambled a single human language into many so that people would disperse and, and repopulate other geographical areas. And all but a handful of the millions of descendants of Noah, Noah had by now turned their backs on God. Idolatry was rampant. Sex was perverse and it had even become part of religious ceremony. Child sacrifice was widespread. And in fairly quick fashion, since the destruction of the Great Flood, the world was once again thoroughly wicked. There were many relatively new spoken and written languages with extensive and elegant vocabularies. Nimrod was the leader of the revolt against God that resulted in the construction of the Tower of Babel. And Nimrod is rightly credited with being the founder 
of what the Bible calls the Mystery Babylon religions. Now, he built the first walled city, and he is credited with inventing the art of warfare. You see, Nimrod was of the line of Ham, who was a son of Noah. Ham represents a line of people that began their wickedness within a few years of stepping out of the ark. In fact, Nimrod was a son of Cush. This is the line of people who populated Africa. So it might surprise you to know that the great Nimrod was a black man. And many ancient glyphs and carvings bear this out. Now, Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. And after he died, his wife Semiramis deified him. And she declared him to be the sun god. She herself was worshipped as the queen of heaven. And as the mother of Tammuz, their child, he was supposedly, Tammuz was supposedly the reincarnation of his father, Nimrod. Now, this triumvirate of sun god, father, queen of heaven, mother, and reincarnated son, that would become the formula for almost all the mystery Babylon religions. That is, the pagan religions of the world right on up till today. We find all throughout history, in all cultures, translated names and titles of Nimrod and Semiramis assigned to their particular pantheon of gods. For instance, in Egypt, the queen of heaven was called Isis. That name sound familiar? In India, Indrani. In Asia, Sibyl. And in the ancient Middle Eastern lands, Ashtaroth. We see her mentioned in several places in the Old Testament. As for Nimrod, another name for him is Baal. Another name yet is the, is the uh, god-man Ninus, the builder of Nineveh. And since his son Tammuz is just the reincarnation of Nimrod, then Tammuz is also Nimrod. Now, hundreds of subcultures had erupted. Communications were very well developed. Clay tablets were now being utilized as the primary writing medium for cuneiform in, in Mesopotamia, while a long way southwest on the African continent, at the mouth of the Nile, the Egyptians were using papyrus and reed styluses to write their hieroglyphics, even building libraries for this growing volume of records. Trade routes were opened from the Mideast to the Far East to India, even to China. The Mediterranean had become a superhighway of shipping that connected all the nations that surrounded it. And these regions and, and nations were, of course, not unknown to each other. Trade was occurring among these various cultures. Stone was still the primary material for tools and weapons. Copper was in widespread use. Bronze was becoming uh, known and iron would soon be discovered. Egypt was already, by the time of Abraham, dotted with pyramids. In fact, by the time Abraham was born, the pyramid building era was over. This was not a world of disinterested, small thinking, primitive peoples. Most were smart. And they were aggressive and they were forward thinking and they were constantly seeking to improve their technology and their quality of life of lives. It was during this same time, much farther west towards the Atlantic Ocean, that an unknown people constructed a very strange structure that scientists still puzzle over to this day. Its name? Stonehenge. Now Avraham, no doubt, started life as a pagan. His father, Terah, Terah, was a merchant of idols. 
standard idols of the various Babylon mystery religions. It's likely, therefore, that Abraham owned and worshipped a number of gods himself. On the other hand, he could have been one of the few that still believed in the one God that Noah spoke of, but that's unlikely in his circumstances. Certainly, if Abraham had despised idols, it's not easy to imagine his getting along very well with his father, who would have taught him otherwise. It's also probable that Abraham worshipped God Almighty as well as some number of other gods. It's very hard to know, because the spiritual mind of the people of that time had no problem with the idea of worshipping many gods and then adding a new one if he or she happened along. People of Abraham's day also tended to put their gods in a kind of hierarchy, uh, with one being dominant, then the rest following in kind of a celestial pecking order. <clears throat> now, one of the great curiosities of history <laughs> is that it appears that atheism, the belief that there is no God, there is no spiritual world, there is nothing greater than mankind, is a relatively modern concept. As every ancient society ever uncovered is found to have worshipped superior beings. Now Abraham had two brothers, which was an unusually small family for that time. One of them died. Abraham married Sarai, Sarah his half-sister, who was unable to give him children. Now, marrying close family members was the norm for that day. And it was not yet forbidden by God. And for reasons were not given, Abraham's father, Terah, gathers his family together and they leave the comforts and security of city life in Ur. And they travel north and west about 600 miles until they arrive at a place called Haran. And why they stopped there, we don't know. Because their clearly stated original destination was a place called Canaan, about 400 miles to the south. In any case, the family decided to settle in Haran. Now what Avraham did for a living there is anybody's guess, but Genesis tells us that when he moved on, he took flocks and herds with him. So he was a prosperous man. And one day when Avraham was about 75 years old, God revealed himself to him. And the way the scriptures seem to flavor it, this is not a first time introduction. God tells Avraham to leave Haran, but he didn't tell him where he's going to go. This probably has something to do with his aged father and surviving brother deciding to stay put. God strikes a covenant, a unilateral contract with Avraham that if he will follow him, God will give him a land of his own, bring forth a great nation from his seed, and then from this the whole world will be blessed. Now there's practically no information at all about Avraham prior to this time. All things considered, he was probably a fairly ordinary person, surprised as anybody at this God choosing him to carry out this grand plan. I've often wondered how God first gained Avraham's attention. I suspect by speaking to him, at least that's the way the Bible kind of presents it. As an Amorite, Avraham was surrounded by a number of idols and gods. It's unlikely any of those pieces of wood, wood or stone ever had much to say to him. So however God communicated with him, it was pretty spectacular. And it was believable enough that Avraham did what he was told. Now, Avraham took his wife Sarai and Lot, Lot, his nephew, this is the son, by the way, of the deceased brother, a few of his servants, probably a number of cousins, and they struck out for parts unknown. Apparently taking a cue from um, from what his father was going to do. He eventually wandered into a place called Canaan. 
stopping at the site of Shechem. Now, Abraham was not a country or a nation. Uh, rather, Canaan was not a country or a nation. It was simply a named region. It was just a generalized geographical area, the same way we use the term Middle East today. Now, the widely scattered inhabitants of Canaan were called Canaanites. And although there were ancient family ties between the residents of the various city states and villages in Canaan, they were not a um, homogenous people. Speaking of the Canaanites is roughly analogous to our speaking of the Middle Easterners of today as Arabs. In reality, the so-called Arabs of the Middle East see themselves based on their national identity. Iraqis, Iranians, Egyptians, Syrians, etc. Much as the Canaanites would have identified themselves more in relation to their own city, state, or tribe, or king, or village to which they were attached. They would not all have even been descended from Canaan. This is much like our modern use of the term Arab, where many of these people we call Arabs have no Arab background. They don't even speak Arabic. But they are nonetheless all lumped together from a Western perspective. Now it's important to understand how the land of Canaan originally came about. <clears throat> a few hundred years prior to Abraham's birth, Noah and his sons, uh, Noah had, uh, Noah had a, this uh, occasion to be humiliated by a son, uh, Ham, of whom Nimrod would be a descendant. We find this in Genesis 9. And Ham had wandered uninvited into his father's tent, and he found him asleep and drunk and naked to boot. And Ham went out from the tent, and he informed his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, who promptly covered up their father's nakedness, making sure they didn't look upon him. Well, when Noah awoke and he found this cloak over him, he was incensed. And when he sobered up, he asked, what happened? Well, his sons informed him, and the irate Noah responded by issuing a curse upon one of Ham's sons, Canaan. The exact nature of that offense is unclear. And why the grandson Canaan took the brunt of Noah's anger were also left to ponder. And as with many biblical curses and blessings, the one Noah pronounced upon Canaan was prophetic in its nature. Some years after this incident, Ham's son Canaan left the home of his father and his grandfather, and he moved to a region far to the south that eventually came to be known by his name, the land of Canaan. And over the centuries, the descendants of Noah's other two sons, Japheth and Shem, remained generally friendly and on favorable terms with, with one another. But the descendants of Noah's third son, Ham, through the specific line of Ham's son Canaan became rivals, and at times enemies of the descendants of Japheth and Shem. Well, many of the sons that Canaan spawned eventually spread out all over the area. They grew, they divided, they became their own separate tribes. They at times established their own city-states and villages. In time, they warred with one another. And some 1,000 years later, we find these same descendants of Canaan who had stayed in the land fighting to keep Moses and the Israelites out. Tribes from other areas also settled in that region. The Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Hittites, the Hivites, even the tribe Avraham originally belonged to, the Amorites, all eventually became enemies of Israel. Now note, if Avraham, who is confirmed in the Bible as a descendant of Shem, was indeed an Amorite, a tribe that technically originated from Ham, it had to have been through intermarriage, maybe just by joining that Amorite tribe with a statement of allegiance. Because by the time of the birth of Abraham, 
centuries had passed since the origination of the Amorite tribe and as it happened with many other tribes the Amorites themselves had grown they'd splintered into factions and some faction members even moved to other areas and became sub-tribes in other regions so the location inside the land of Canaan that Abraham first stopped was at a place called Shechem now today Shechem is known as the Arab city of Nablus, located in the West Bank area of dispute. There at Shechem, God made clear his plan for Abraham. And as written in Genesis 12 7, God said that this was the land that he was going to give his descendants. Abraham built an altar there. He presumably made an animal sacrifice, and then after a short stay, he moved on, eventually all the way south to Egypt, because a severe famine had gripped the area of Canaan. And after a run-in with Egypt's pharaoh, in which Abraham had to give up his wife Sarah to the pharaoh momentarily, apparently to avoid a very dangerous confrontation, the famine ended, and Abraham took his family back up to Canaan. Well, Abraham arrived back in Canaan, a much wealthier man than when he left, because the Pharaoh thought Abraham's God was a threat to him. So he gave Abraham valuable gifts so that he might leave without incurring this God's wrath. Though Abraham now had all this silver and gold, the real wealth of the family lay in their flocks and herds. Well, about this same time, Far to the north, back up in Mesopotamia, Abraham's birthplace, thousands mourned the death of Noah. Yep, the Noah of Noah's Ark, who died at over 900 years of age. Well, Canaan was a pretty tough place to live. Totally unlike the much more dependable Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, which was Avraham's origin, famines were just a part of life in Canaan. Everything was based on the soil, which means it was dependent on the fickle rains. No rain, no crops, no pasture land, no survival. Which would explain why the Canaanites might have held the world record for the number of gods they had. I mean, they had a god for rain, they had a god for wind, they had a god for clouds, they had a god for barley, you name it, they had a god for it. But the chief god was Baal, Nimrod. At least he was the most popular. Well, despite the difficult living conditions, apparently Avraham and his nephew Lot prospered. So much so that they had to part company because their herds and their flocks were growing large enough to outstrip the land that they mutually occupied. And it caused a lot of disputes among the herdsmen. We find that in Genesis 13. Lot must have liked the city life. Because where did he move? Sodom. Bad choice. Somewhere near the southwestern bank of the Dead Sea. Now, a little time later, without warning, peaceful old Avraham finds himself having to be a warrior leader. Because it seems that some kings, that is, several city state rulers, from a region east and north of Canaan decided to invade five Canaanite kings in the approximate same area where Abraham was living. And in the process, these invading kings sacked the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot became one of their prisoners. Now, family being what it is, Avraham recruits 318 men, and off they go to chase down these kings of the east in hopes of rescuing Lot. And a few miles north of Damascus, Syria, they catch up to these raiders, and they defeat them, and they free Lot. And then they reclaim all of their stolen booty. Well, Avraham returns to the cheers of the people and the gratitude, of course, of those Canaanite kings. He's also honored by the mysterious king and high priest of the city of Shalem. Centuries later, this city will be called Jerusalem. 
His name is Melchizedek. It is Hebrew tradition that Melchizedek was none other than Shem, a son of Noah. Now this is entirely feasible, but it's not certain. Melchizedek is actually a title. It's not a name. In Hebrew, this name, this title rather, means king of righteousness. And although Shem would have been hundreds of years old by then, the table of generations in the Bible absolutely indicates Shem was indeed alive while Abraham was living in Canaan. Making Melchizedek to actually be Shem would answer a lot of questions about this obscure but most interesting Bible character who later will be compared in some ways to Christ. Now we arrive now at a very important point in the Bible in Genesis chapter 14 verse 13 where the first known use of the word Hebrew is presented to us and it is ascribed to Avraham. Now, no other ancient source uses the word Hebrew as the title of a specific people group prior to this usage in Genesis. There's a lot of conjecture as to this word's origination and its meaning. Some scholars think it identifies a new culture of which Abraham is its founder. Others believe it's a term that represents a new religion. In fact, the world's first monotheistic religion. Another line of thinking is that the word Hebrew is a perversion of the Sumerian word Hapiru, which when spoken in ancient Semitic sounds almost identical to the word Ipiru, meaning wanderers or outcasts. People that have no particular ethnic or regional ties. Modern Hebrew scholars almost unanimously say that the word means one who crossed over, likely referring to Abraham crossing over the Euphrates River in order to journey south to Canaan. Now, the issue of the origination of the word Hebrew revolves around whether the term is originally used was religious. Maybe it was racial, could have been cultural, might have just been descriptive. Regardless of its etymology, Judaism and, and Christianity see Hebrew as a term describing the biblical ancestral line of promises that were made with the covenant that God gave to Abraham. And Abraham ratified by leaving Mesopotamia and then moving south to Canaan in search of the land that God promised he would give to him. Therefore, the Hebrew line begins with Abraham as its founder, then it moves on to his son Isaac, then Isaac's son Jacob, who would eventually be renamed Israel, and then finally to the 12 tribes of Israel, which includes the Jews as we know them today. All are included under the title of Hebrew. Now, back in Canaan, after a short stay in Egypt, Abraham, having so long lived a nomadic lifestyle, again in cyclical need of new pasture lands for his flocks and his herds, he decides to move on. But this time, he and his clan backtrack somewhat, and they settle in the desert oasis known as Beersheba. Beersheba. And Sarah, his wife, still has not given Abraham a child, and they both have given up hope, even though implicit in God's promises to them um, to make a great nation out of them is children. Now, Sarai, Sarah, very old, beyond childbearing years, gives her maidservant, Hagar, to Abraham to bear him a child in her stead. This was a completely normal and customary practice for 2000 BC. And Jewish tradition says Hagar was an Egyptian. She was possibly even the daughter of the Pharaoh acquired during Avraham's stay in Egypt. Now likely Hagar was one of the gifts that Pharaoh had given to Abraham as a peace offering. And it was a customary way also to create an alliance. Well, Hagar becomes pregnant 
Sarai becomes greatly jealous, treats Hagar so terribly that she runs away. But God finds Hagar, convinces her to go back, and promises her she will have a boy child. She returns, and pretty soon she gives birth to Ishmael. Ishmael. Now, before Hagar becomes pregnant, God formalizes his covenant with Abraham. And in typical Middle Eastern fashion, an animal is sacrificed. It's cut up into pieces. It's divided into two piles. And then the agreeing parties walk between the two piles as an indication of their mutual acceptance of the terms. However, we're told that only God walked through the pieces of this animal. This is an important detail because it indicates that the covenant had been, that had been made between God and Abraham was unilateral. That means Abraham had no duties to perform. Whatever was to happen was God's responsibility. The terms of the covenant would be carried out regardless of what Abraham or his descendants did. That's why this covenant is so often referred to as a promise. God promised things to Abraham. Abraham made no promises to God. And it's at this point that God gives Abraham the right of male circumcision as the sign and seal of his everlasting covenant with the Hebrew people. It is observed to this day. Male circumcision was not uncommon in those times, but it was not known to have been associated with a covenant until this incident. Well, a few years later, Abraham's elderly wife, Sarah, shocks everybody by becoming pregnant at the age of 90. And she gives birth to Yitzhak, Isaac. Now, although people at that time did live a little longer than we do now, Sarai was still way beyond childbearing years. Rather than now feeling satisfied, however, Sarai doesn't like the competition. So she throws a fit. And she demands that Avraham disown Hagar and her child, Ishmael now 13 years old. Avraham complies. Hagar and Ishmael are thrown out of the camp. While out in the desert and near death, mother and child are rescued by God, who tells Hagar that Ishmael was going to father a great nation. In fact, he's going to produce 12 princes. Ishmael will go on to become the forefather of the Arab races, and is often, erroneously, referred to by Muslims as the father of Islam. The dispute that began over Ishmael and Isaac, brought about by Abraham and Sarah's disbelief and their impatience, is being played out before our eyes every day in the never-ending Middle East conflicts. Now, it's most important that we pause here and we examine for just a moment, <clears throat> a key element of God's plan for mankind is it's outlined in Genesis. One that is apparently misunderstood, even by many within today's Christian church. And that most important element answers this question. Just exactly which of Avraham's descendants would be used to bring about the promises contained in the covenant made by God with Avraham? That is, which family line from Abraham does the covenant apply to? Islam claims that God is going to bring about whatever his plans are for the world through Abraham's son Ishmael and Ishmael's descendants. Jews and Christians claim that God's divine plans will be carried out through the descendants of Abraham's son Isaac. But put into contemporary terms, which group is God's chosen people, the Hebrews from Isaac or the Arab Muslims from Ishmael? This is a distinct fork in the road. It cannot be bypassed. One direction is correct. The other direction is not. 
No amount of religious, no amount of political tolerance can bring a compromise with this. The answer to this most fundamental question is found in Genesis 17. I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> It starts in verse 15, so if you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's page 15. How convenient. We're going to read from verses 15 through 22 of Genesis chapter 17. God said to Avraham, As for Sarai your wife, you are not to call her Sarai mockery. Her name is to be Sarah, princess. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. Truly, I will bless her. She will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. At this time, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. And he thought to himself, will a child be born to a man of a hundred years old? Will Sarah give birth at ninety? Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael could live in your presence. God answered, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you are to call him Yitzhak, laughter. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. But as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful. I will give him many descendants. He will father 12 princes. I will make of him a great nation, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. With that, God finished speaking with Abraham and went up from him. It's several years after Ishmael's been born. Abraham is well satisfied that he has in Ishmael the male heir to his wealth, to his tribe, and most importantly to God's covenant promises. But then quite unexpectedly, God appears. And he tells Abraham that Sarai is going to bear him a son. And that it is this son that God is going to use to carry on the promises that he'd given to Abraham. And the startled Abraham argues against this. He asks God, please make it Ishmael that is blessed as his heir, not this as yet to be born child. Now, first of all, Sarai is a very old woman. It simply can't be possible that she could conceive in that long dead womb of hers. But second, most important to Avraham is that Ishmael is currently his much beloved one and only son. All of his plans and hopes for the future rested in Ishmael. From the moment Hagar conceived, Avraham was overjoyed with the prospect of having a son. That son was Ishmael. It is certain that Avraham told Ishmael, almost, a, well, a teenager, basically, at the time that God threw this curveball at him, all about God. No doubt he told Ishmael that he would carry with him God's incredible blessing and plan for mankind. Suddenly, without warning, it seems God changed all of Abraham's plans. Avraham fell on his face. He begged God that Ishmael would be the heir to the covenant. God emphatically says, no. But then in his mercy, God told Abraham not to worry. That Ishmael would prosper. He'd be a great man. He'd bear 12 princes. That means 12 tribal leaders. He'd have countless descendants. And that is exactly what happened. As the millions of members of the various Arab tribes we see today are the result. Nonetheless, it would be Isaac, God said, the child that would be born to Sarah. It's he that would carry on with the promises of the covenant. Now, Avraham was anything but happy with this new situation. Yet, obediently, he complied. 
it would be Isaac. Isaac's descendants, the Hebrews, they would carry on the promise first given to Avraham. Well, despite all of his human failings, in Genesis 15, 6, we see that he, Avraham, believed Adonai, God, and that God credited it to him as righteousness. While on the surface it's wonderful to see God's mercy and grace in action, there's something much deeper in this passage to consider. God has just given mankind His formula for personal salvation. That is, we are required to believe God, meaning to trust Him. And if we will do that, He will credit us with righteousness. 700 years before Moshe, Moses, before Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai, 2,000 years before Yeshua, Jesus, was crucified, God revealed the only path to a right relationship with Him. Trust in Him. Well, we find that some years after Hagar and Ishmael's desert ordeal, young Yitzhak, Isaac, has his own near-death experience. Out of the blue, God orders Avraham to take Yitzhak to an altar on a hilltop and to sacrifice him. And I ask you, let's drop this picture of a young, innocent little child being led out to sacrifice. Isaac was about 30 years old at this time. He well knew what was happening. And though this was certainly devastating, it would not have seemed all that strange to Abraham because human sacrifice to a god was fairly normal for his day. And it was a particularly customary within the pagan tribes of Canaan. Now, Avraham obeys. He takes Isaac to Mount Moriah, the place where the temple will be built some 900 years into the future. Today, this place is called the Temple Mount in the heart of Jerusalem. And moments before Abraham is going to plunge his, his flint blade into his son Isaac's chest, God stops him. And he provides a ram, a male sheep, to be sacrificed in his stead. Another covenant follows, promising to bring forth many great nations from him, millions of descendants. Well, a relieved father and son return home. Sarah, Isaac's mother, dies shortly afterwards. Hebrew tradition says the cause of her death was the strain of Isaac's experience on the altar of sacrifice. And in the city of Hebron, Avraham buys land with a cave on it, and there he buries his beloved wife, Sarah. Well, Avraham is now very old, and he appoints a trusted servant to go and find a suitable wife for his son Isaac. And Abraham despises these local Canaanite women. And so he directs his servant to journey northward back to his ancestral homeland in Mesopotamia, to find an appropriate member of Abraham's extended family for, for Isaac to wed. And in the city of Nahor, the servant finds Rivka, Rebekah, the daughter of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Now, although the place, by the way, the servant went was named Nahor, it was not the namesake of the, of the brother. Nahor was that brother who so many years earlier had elected to stay behind rather than journey with Abraham and the family south to Canaan. Well, about that time that Rivka arrives back in Canaan to marry Yitzhak, Abraham dies at 175 years of age, and he is buried alongside his beloved Sarah, Avraham revered by Jew, Christian, and Muslim, is a man with character flaws, plenty of weaknesses, all the other human attributes that trip every one of us up. But he was loved by God, and he trusted God. And God blessed him for it. And we'll continue with this Old Testament survey next week. Would you please rise?